Hello, I am Peter Mengi with St. Goban Crystals, and I am presenting Very Low Afterglow Cesium Iodide Scintillator using antimony and other metal cations. And I would like to recognize the contributions of my colleague, Fang Meng, uh, who grew all the crystals and did almost all of the characterization of the materials. So what I am presenting is mostly her work. So scintillator afterglow is a bad thing, and it causes degradation in CT images. To define it, afterglow is the long-lived time component of the scintillation pulse decay that can last for many milliseconds. So the plot here is showing the scintillator photodiode signal uh, versus time in milliseconds. And the time from 0 to 100 milliseconds is showing uh, the diode signal when the x-ray beam is on. We normalize that to 1, and then when the x-ray beam is shut off at time 0, we see that the scintillator continues to put out scintillation light, um, and we see that after 100 milliseconds, it's still putting out light at a rate of 0.61% of when the x-ray beam was on, and going down slowly to 0.4% at 500 milliseconds. So this extra light that it's putting out can produce arc and ring artifacts in the reconstructed uh, images of CT scans. And these artifacts are particularly apparent in image regions extending from areas of low attenuation to high. Uh, the photo on the right shows an example of arc and ring artifacts in a water phantom, uh, which I took from uh, that reference listed there. So people in the know might ask, well, doesn't low afterglow cesium iodide already exist? Uh, what is it that we are trying to do? Well, yes. Uh, there have been co-dopants that have been previously been discovered that do suppress afterglow um, with research on this going back over 16 years. Europium, samarium, bismuth, and ytterbium uh, have all been identified as being able to suppress afterglow if you put a little bit of it into cesium iodide. There are also alternatives to cesium iodide such as cadmium tungstate, gadolinium oxysulfide, and there are garnet ceramics that also have uh, low afterglow. But uh, we at St. Goban Crystals, we still get requests from customers uh, for our cesium iodide products to be used in uh, CT systems, uh, particularly in uh, security and industrial CT systems. Uh, human medical uh, have uh, pretty much abandoned cesium iodide because of the high afterglow. And most of them these days are gadolinium oxysulfide yeah, and its derivatives. But there are many good reasons to use cesium to iodide if uh, the afterglow was low. It has m many desirable properties, such as high light output. It has good spectral match to silicon. It has a faster primary pulse than gadolinium oxysulfide. Uh, but perhaps its best quality is that it can be grown cheaply in large bulk crystal uh, growths. The photo uh, I'm showing here on the right is a 500 millimeter diameter uh, cesium iodide ingot of the type that we grow at St. Gauvin. And what we were trying to do with this study is find a co-doping solution that works throughout the large ingot uh, grown by Bridgman Technique. So the, the elements that uh, are listed above here, these have high segregation coefficients and it can uh, reduce the uh, amount of the ingot that is has suitably low low afterglow and has suitably high light output. So when they segregate, we get low concentrations of the codopants at the top of the crystal, high concentration at the bottom of the crystal. And so you might get regions of uh, poor afterglow suppression at the top and poor light output uh, at the bottom. So uh, we are looking for 
co-dopants that can suppress afterglow at very low concentrations and perhaps be able to use two or more in combination that have different segregation rates in order to enhance and overlap regions of good performance. Okay, so what have we done uh, in our search? Well, our experimental strategy is to use an Edisonian method, which means to try as many different things as possible, like uh, Edison supposedly tried a thousand different ways to make a light bulb filament. Um, we're kind of doing the same thing with um, codopants and growth procedures. So to do this, we are use two versatile R&D Bridgman furnaces that we have uh, at our plant in Ohio. They can grow 63 millimeter diameter ingots in graphite crucibles and up to 100 millimeters long. They can heat up to 1300 C and they can operate sealed or unsealed. So we can grow crystals in vacuum. Uh, we can grow them in inert or reducing or oxidizing atmospheres as well. So from 2018 until now, for the last two and a half years, uh, we've grown 104 crystals covering uh, 31 candidate uh, code opens and combinations. So in this presentation, I'm concentrating on the metal cations that we've tried, but we've also tried different growth atmospheres, different anions as well. But uh, here I'm just uh, sticking to the good results that we found with uh, metal cation doping. So we focused mainly on those uh, elements that uh, have more than one natural possible valence state. Uh, without going into it, there are reasons why we think uh, those might be particularly good candidates. The periodic table on the right shows the, a map of the elements that we tried. The photos on the bottom show some sample uh, ingots, which you can see have different color and clarity and, uh, and uh, whether or not they can grow intact without cracking. For example, when we tried tantalum, uh, the ingot uh, had so much residual stress that it uh, would always crack. So what did we find when using uh, these different code opens? Well, we did identify several new good afterglow suppressing code opens. And here I'm defining good as being the light output is equivalent to standard cesium iodide and the afterglow being better than the best of our standard cesium iodide. So in the plot, uh, I have the axes of afterglow at 100 milliseconds in percent and afterglow at 500 milliseconds in percent. So down and to the left uh, is better. All of the red data points are the average of uh, large uh, ingots grown by either Bridgman or Karopoulos technique. Uh, and I think this is spans over about an eight year period. The green data points show the uh, the good ones that we found, the good ones being chromium, manganese, zirconium, cadmium, and antimony. And all of these produce uh, nice low uh, afterglows. And the number I put in parentheses here is the light output in comparison to standard cesium iodide. So all of these candidates uh, maintain good light output. And we can see that with antimony, not only does it produce low afterglow, but it also actually enhances the light output, uh, which is quite nice. Um, uh, researchers using samarium have also shown that the right amount of samarium can increase the light output as well. Uh, and we found a similar effect uh, with antimony. And antimony plus bismuth is actually even better. And we can get extremely low afterglows if we use antimony and bismuth together without sacrificing uh, light output. So on this table here on the right, I show our typical results for antimony and bismuth. We see 0.06% afterglow at 100 milliseconds and below 0.02% uh, for our best results. And this which we get uh, uh, quite often in every ingot that we grow, we see it this low. 
We're still trying to determine what exactly are the parameters that allow it to get this low. But we can see it's pushing down into the afterglow regime of like gadolinium oxysulfide, which is typically at about 0 0.004 or 0 0.005%. So we're starting to get on the order of gadolinium oxysulfide, and again, with the light output being better than standard cesium iodide. Um, but does it work well throughout large ingots? And the answer there is yes. Here we see examples from a 200 millimeter diameter, 150 millimeter long ingot. And we see that the afterglow suppression is nice and uniform. Um, it doesn't matter if we take the samples from the top or the bottom or the inside or the outside. It's all the same, including the light output. And with antimony and bismuth, again, very uniform light output and very good afterglow suppression. So this size ingot is production scale, although it is not uh, 500 millimeters in diameter like I showed before, but we think it will work for 500 millimeters in diameter as well, because actually very little antimony or bismuth are required to produce uh, afterglow suppression. So here in this plot, I'm plotting antimony uh, concentration, bismuth concentration, and afterglow. And we see that the minimum afterglow region is also in a nice region of high light output. And notice also, very interestingly, we only need about one part per million of each to do this. So the good region actually expands about a factor of 20 in antimony and bismuth uh, concentration. So that means we can have uh, segregation differences of over 20 from the top to the bottom of the ingot, and it will still work. So to summarize, we found uh, these five good um, uh, codopants, which suppress, light out, pu suppress afterglow without suppressing light output with antimony plus bismuth on the range of about one part per million. Uh, being particularly good. We've been sampling pixels and arrays to interested customers. So if anyone listening is interested, uh, please contact us at our booth about getting uh, samples to you. Thank you.